Um, I think we got quite a few in. If anybody pops in late, I'll be watching. So. Okay, thanks. All right, so happy Thursday afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our full nonprofit forum. We're keeping the tradition going any way we can, and we got a really great program today. So um, before I introduce Tim, I was going to introduce Kristen. I just wanted to remind you of uh, two other things that we're doing. Um, one is virtual, and it's happening tomorrow. It's uh, October 23rd at 10 a.m., and we have partnered with the Cape May County Chamber and the Greater Atlantic City Chamber to uh, bring building resiliency for uh, um, families working and learning together. So this is completely a free event. Uh, if you want to um, get more information on it or or um, interested in registering, you just can reach out to Kate. And we're also going to post another link to it later on this evening on the Chamber's Facebook page. So it's something that, um, you know, really might be um, a benefit to whether you're, you know, you yourself are in that position or you have some coworkers that are. So we wanted to provide that. Um, also, uh, save the date for November 11th. It is an in-person meeting at the mainland, and we have freeholder uh, director uh, uh, Joe Vicari, who's going to be speaking about uh, the COVID uh, crisis and um, you know the county's position, as well as us talking about what we're going to be trying to do for <laughs> 2021. But we're um, certainly going to be able to kick off the holiday season, talk about some programs. It will be uh, completely uh, COVID safe. Uh, everybody will have plenty of social distancing. We're gonna cap the, the attendance and we're gonna be in a room for pretty much double what's gonna be there. Uh, and breakfast is gonna be served by the staff. Uh, so everything uh, with uh, hand sanitizer stations and everything's gonna be set up. So we hope to see you there. And again, if you have any more questions or you're interested in joining us, uh, you can reach out to Kate or you could just go right to the website or call the office. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna present Tim Hart, who's gonna talk a little bit about this valuable program that Ocean County Culture and Heritage is bringing to the nonprofits uh, so that you can further continue this conversation with your board, um, with your program director, with your development director, with your volunteer coordinator. So um, thank you, Tim, and uh, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much. So we're really fortunate that uh, Kristen lives within our footprint. She's a resident of Barnegat and um, she's been, she had worked at the state of New Jersey, uh, has a tremendous um, uh, academic background and experience background. And uh, so we're really fortunate that she's one of us and that she's been able to help. So we have been trying very hard uh, to deal with inclusiveness and diversity, all those things. And um, it's hard in Ocean County because on the surface, it seems like we're not as diverse a population as some other places. Uh, but particularly given the summer and the feelings people have, we knew we needed to do something. And so Chris is gonna explain a program to you uh, today, uh, which uh, some of the groups represented here are participating with. And um, then we're going to probably do a follow-up in the spring because a lot of the programming that we had planned will not be able to take place. And so, um, uh, Kristen, it's uh, you were on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to introduce you all to the uh, the program that we've created at the Ocean County Cultural and Heritage Commission. I'm a consultant that works with Ocean County Cultural and Heritage Commission. So I'm really, um, I'm honored and privileged that the county um, is working in this area of diversity and inclusion. Um, it is important work and I'm excited to see so many people here wanting to hear more about what the county is doing. So um, Building Bridges, Fostering Inclusion and Cultural Organizations is the project that I'm going to talk to you all about today. Um, I think it's a case study that you all could think about in relation to your own organizations um, to perhaps draw key themes from it, um, draw inspiration and ideas, and um, just start thinking about how to have these conversations. Um, and they're difficult conversations to have. And so um, the project is built around four main components, um, the idea of encouraging dialogue, um, developing strong relationships, building capacity, and professional development. And we're going to talk through all of those um, and how they relate to our organizations and how perhaps they could relate to the work in which you all work. So a little background for the project development. Um, so when COVID happened, it was 
still happening uh, when the lockdown orders came through. Um, I was working with the staff over at Ocean County Cultural and Heritage Commission to think through how we could still serve our constituents and how we could best help the, um, the re-grantees in their grant pool. Um, and so we had been thinking about um, opportunities and professional development opportunities and what the needs were of the organizations. And like Tim had mentioned, diversity and inclusion was an area in which um, the groups had expressed um, a, they needed to know more and they wanted to talk more and they they had a lot of questions. So we wanted to be able to help them talk through that, um, help them better understand ways in which they can implement that type of work in their own organizations. And so we saw this as an opportunity to do that. And so that leads into the next point of operational changes that COVID-19 um, forced upon everyone. So at the onset of the pandemic, there was um, the lockdown orders and then some of the organizations opened back up when it was allowed, um, but there was capacity issues in terms of you know reduced numbers in their in their sites, um, some organizations decided that they were going to stay closed for longer. Um, but you heard from all of the organizations that they still wanted to do the work that they're committed to, and we wanted to be able to assist them to do that work. It's important work that they're doing the cultural organizations um, and the nonprofit world as a whole, and we wanted to make sure that they felt that there was. Um, that they were valued in that sense and that there was something that they could be contributing to in the um, in the interim and in the long haul that we're finding that COVID is um, presenting itself to be. And so um, we've talked about with the organizations that, especially when the lockdown orders started, um, the day-to-day -day monotony of running an institution changed. And so um, it allowed for people to start thinking about things and having big conversations and be thinking about big thoughts in a way in which perhaps previously they couldn't and because it, just running the institution took a lot of time and things like that. So we wanted to capitalize on the um, the silver linings, if you will, that COVID-19 operational changes forced our hands to, um, to allow us to perhaps have these conversations and still gather in a virtual way, but to talk with one another about how we could proceed for the benefit of the cultural institutions and the benefit of society as a whole for diversity and inclusion. And so um, we were also thinking about the project team. We had, I have spoken about our, um, our organizations. And so the way in which Building Bridges works is that we are lucky enough to have 10 current organizations. And when we launched the project, we didn't anticipate, honestly, so many organizations to be interested in this work. But we were really excited to see that 10 organizations said that they wanted to work with us. And so in working with us, what that means is that the of a community engagement assistant that is partnered with them to work them through the project and uh, work side by side with them. And so we make sure that the organizations, we call them partners and that's purposeful in the sense that this is a partnership. The, the um, project staff being Ocean County Cultural and Heritage staff, the community engagement assistants and the partner organizations, we're all working through this together. Um, COVID-19 has shown us that no one has a playbook on how to handle the pandemic. And all of these things are also very new to everyone. So it's beneficial to us all if we're all able to rely upon each other in ways in which perhaps we had it in the past. So to think about partnerships and how to best um, strengthen those ties. And so for the community engagement assistance, um, the cultural and heritage staff and I had had a lot of conversations throughout the summer about um, the way in which COVID-19 was impacting um, the nonprofit world, impacting every aspect of life, but there was a real component that sometimes was being lost, and that was the students that are currently in college and university and the recent graduates. So the students coming out in 20, May 2020, they never anticipated their graduations to look like that. The idea of the land, the work landscape changed for them significantly. The students that were enrolled in school in September 2020 for them as well, it was entirely different than any other generation will have known. Um, so we wanted to be able to offer something to them to know that we are committed to the future of the field as well. So we envisioned and we were able to execute the idea of working with community engagement assistance. So we reached out to partnerships. So the, um, the project as a whole is really built upon the idea of reaching out 
and strengthening those ties and leveraging relationships. So we were fortunate enough to work with Stockton University, to work with Monmouth University. Um, we, we have seven assistants that, so some assistants are doubling up uh, to help us with the, to have those 10 organizations. Um, but you see in the project that there is a lot of excitement about this. Um, we have had a lot of meetings with different stakeholders. The um, County Cultural and Heritage Commission, they're all very excited to see how this plays out and they would like to do something similar in the other 20 counties. Um, when we've spoken with the state and the New Jersey Historical Commission, they also want to see how they could implement something that serves both um, a younger audience in terms of the emerging professionals, and then also the organizations and to be able to bring those two together to think about different perspectives and how that implements and plays out in program development and how you think about it when um, making decisions and all of these things that we're giving the community engagement assistance, um, meaningful opportunities for them to work side by side with the organizations. And when we've worked, when we've talked rather with the community engagement assistants, um, it's been really great to see how enthused they are to be working with the organizations. They're very excited about the work that the Ocean County cultural nonprofit world is doing. And one of the key things that they're, um, they keep mentioning is that they are for the organizations we're working with, they tend to be smaller in size, but not smaller in power, if you will, um, that they're small but mighty. And so that they're getting a lot of hands-on experience in how a smaller organization works. So they will, when they decide to come out of school in whatever field they wanna go into, some of them are in museum fields, some are in arts administration. Um, and so they'll have a better understanding of what the profession looks like, and they'll be a little better equipped. And I'm really proud that we're able to, to help them in that way. So then um, where the idea of the project is all based on encouraging dialogue. So um, we've been telling our organizations that it's kind of like a thought exercise, if you will. It's bringing people together to know that these conversations are hard and difficult to talk about diversity and inclusion and how to reach historically underrepresented audiences um, to do that thoughtful examination of who you are serving and who you are not serving. That's, that's difficult and it's tricky. And sometimes people don't know where to start to have those conversations. Sometimes people don't know how to have those conversations. So we're offering them a, a dedicated space and a safe space to have those conversations to talk about audiences in which they want to serve, but they haven't been able to reach them yet. Um, so the work, the project is, um, that there was a, we have already had a kickoff meeting with our organizations um, and we've started on the one-on-one -on -one partner meetings. So each organization will be able to meet with their community engagement assistant twice through the length of the project. And in those meetings, they'll be able to talk through their, um, their needs and their wants and how best they can move forward in diversity and inclusion and diversity and inclusion being um, thinking about their board thinking about their audience that they serve, thinking about for um, the history organizations, thinking about their collections and their research, um, thinking about the public programs they do. For the arts organization, it's thinking about what type of performances they put on. So we're really encouraging our organizations to think about diversity and inclusion in the broadest sense possible because we all do benefit from uh, inclusive spaces that we learn from one another. And the cultural world, its beauty is is that it's a, a place to gather, to share ideas, exchange ideas, and get to know another, another person that is that shared humanity. And so that's what we're encouraging our groups to think about. Um, and we're highlighting the importance of conversations. And I think this is really key. And um, I, like I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm proud to say that Ocean County Cultural and Heritage Commission is dedicating financial resources, staff resources to this, and that the state is also dedicating resources. Both the Arts Council and the New Jersey Historical Commission is dedicating um, funding to this project. And so it's important for the organizations, for our partner organizations to hear that because it's a little bit different than what they're used to in terms of we're telling them there's not something tangible, there's not a project deliverable that we're looking for at the end of the, um, at the, end of the program. Rather, we're just want them to have those conversations. And for the um, both the county and the state to say that, that that's worthy of funding 
it really speaks volumes of um, where where we are and where where we're headed. So that's exciting for the organizations. We talk about developing strong relationships. And so um, thinking through with the organizations, the idea of building relationships before creating programs for, um, you know, oftentimes when we're creating a program, we think about what we perhaps would like to see, what um, we think is a need, but we don't really think about the audience. And so that's a shift for some of our organizations. And that's okay for it to be a shift, for them to recognize that you need to have those connections before you can create different um, different programming in terms of different than what you're used to. And um, to tell more diverse stories in your institutions and to lift up untold stories in your institutions. And to, so to do all of that, you need to make those connections so you know what are the untold stories and you know what are the, um, the diverse stories that you haven't been identifying. And so we encourage the partner organizations to make community connections and for them to identify the communities that they haven't yet served and how can they best serve them to start thinking about it being um, a mutually beneficial relationship. And so you go to their event um, whatever or audience you're looking to serve, and then you reach out to them and try to better understand that audience. So um, we have the community engagement assistants um, that are very passionate about the idea of social media, and it's been really wonderful to see because they are thinking about even the social media component in the presence, that social media is changing, there's different platforms, um, but that there needs to be you're reaching different people through the different platforms and that you need to think about how best to do that. And so the organizations have been so excited to hear from the community engagement assistant on just tips and techniques of how to utilize social media and that they have someone to turn to about um, things in which they perhaps didn't really know that, uh, you know, they didn't know that they should be posting on Instagram so frequently, or that um, perhaps they, if they want to reach a younger, a younger audience, excuse me, that maybe TikTok is something that they would consider. You know, these are all just ideas. And so, um, the community engagement assistants, we've encouraged them to share their perspective, and that's, in my opinion, that we really can't. Um, highlight enough how important that is, that to be um, an inclusive space, to have um, a sense of equity, we need to really value everyone's perspective and we need to value diverse opinions. And so for the community engagement assistants to know that they're empowered to share their ideas and their thoughts and to share um, their own perspective, that that is beneficial both now, but when they are moving into the field, that um, they'll be better equipped for how to um, how to make decisions and how to pitch ideas. So it's um, it's been really great to see that it the project so far is helping multiple audiences and helping <laughs> different uh, different audiences, and it's serving multiple goals. So. Um, it, the project, we hope that it builds capacity, so it cultivates. We have spoken about how we're giving opportunities for emerging professionals. Um, we are strengthening community ties. We're encouraging the organizations to start thinking about how they could reach out to different audiences um, and to think about different ways that they Perhaps they've tried in the past. We've heard from organizations that they've tried to work in this area before, but they haven't had much success. But um, we need to reevaluate what success means. It's I have told organizations before that this isn't going to be solved in one conversation or in two conversations in the length of the project, but the idea that we need to make progress towards reaching more diverse audiences, that is uh, an important goal and it's uh, a necessary goal. And it's something that will benefit everyone if we just bring in more people into our institution so that we better understand one another. We uh, talk about the idea of supporting one another and to build a network. And so, um, when we were thinking about the project, um, I don't think that we necessarily thought about, honestly, the way in which the organizations would start to lean on one another. And so what we've seen is for the cultural organizations that we're working with, they're all responding differently to COVID-19, um, but they are in 
they're in great want and need for conversations with other cultural organizations. So they are starting to lean on one another in ways that we haven't previously seen. They are excited to share ideas of what's worked for them, to um, pitch suggestions to one another. And so we're hoping that it builds a stronger community here in Ocean County, a stronger cultural network in which they could gather more frequently to have round tables, if you will, to have discussions about um, best practices and to just strengthen the cultural community here in the county. And so uh, we knew that professional development would be a really key component to the project. And so what we started with is we offered the partner organizations and the community engagement assistance conference passes to ASLH. And ASLH stands for the American Association for State and Local History. And so they offer a conference every year. And typically, it's a, a, an in-person conference, but it went virtual this year. And so the county ended up purchasing 40 conference passes that they were able to distribute through the program. And for a lot of our organizations, our partner organizations, this was the first time that they were able to attend ASLH. Last year, ASLH was right here in Philly, but because of budget restrictions, because of um, the size of the organizations, things like that, it just wasn't in their reach. And so we knew that with it being virtual, that there was an opportunity to engage the program participants and our partner organizations, our community engagement assistants, to a larger conversation, to, the, to hear the national dialogue about diversity and inclusion and how people are responding to it, and that there are a multitude of ways in which people are thinking about diversity and inclusion. And so we have, um, we had the participants attend ASLH conference, and so it was uh, about a week long all the sessions were recorded so they were made available after the fact as well and so our first meetings what we've been doing is we've been gathering together just to debrief about the ASLH conference and to share thoughts and our ideas about what we heard and to get examples <laughs> about um, different case studies that we've heard that were inspiring to us um, our impressions of the conference and so to allow us all to think about it differently. And so um, we've had great we've had great feedback about ASLH that the organizations didn't um, be given that they hadn't yet experienced the conference in in any capacity of virtual or um, in person, that they really liked being able to talk to other people from around the country. And for ASLH, given that it was virtual, they, they were able to get people from all 50 states. So you're really bringing a diverse set of ideas together and a diverse set of perspectives. And that is the, the, the program participants were able to see what that looks like and how that unfolds to have those conversations and to start that dialogue and to continue it through to the lens of the project. And then for the community engagement assistance, this is a paid in, um, internship, if you will. And so that was also very purposeful that we wanted to make sure that the, um, the project was thinking about diversity and inclusion and to make sure that access, that it's not uh, always possible for all to be able to take an unpaid internship. So the county was able to pay um, the community engagement assistance, which is really wonderful. And so that they get the time to go to these professional development opportunities. They were also invited and participated in ASLH and they get additional professional development opportunities. So they're able to better understand what the expectations are when they come into the field and that they hear about the best practices within the field and that they're able to start to formulate opinions and ideas so that they feel empowered when they go to these meetings. So we've had great success with the project. And I think that um, one of the key things is the idea that the, um, the partner organizations feel that they are also they're helping someone else. And so they are helping the community engagement assistants um, familiarize themselves with the field to foster growth within the field. And the partner organizations have been really proud of the fact that they're making a lasting impact on this young person's professional de development and growth. And the community engagement assistants have also felt that for working with the organizations, they are better able to understand the way in which they operate, the way in which they have um, done the work so far. They are providing an outside perspective, but they are understanding the organizations a little bit more 
And I think that there's a lot to be said of that, that we are through the idea of bringing diverse groups together to even work on the project, to realize that conversations are so very important to have. And sometimes those conversations are difficult, but just because they're difficult doesn't mean we shouldn't have them. So I'm really excited to, um, to be able to, oh, I'm sorry, to be able to talk through the project with you all today. And um, just the hope that you all can think about the ways in which you could work in diversity and inclusion in your own institutions. Um, are there any questions? How, how many um, How many of these assistants do you have? We have seven assistants. So we have um, seven assistants and they range from um, current students, current undergraduate students, recent graduates and current graduate students. Yeah. But, but I think the, the key was that it's not one size fits all. Um, sometimes there's, uh, I think organizations, once this topic comes up, as Kristen said, it's difficult because a lot of people feel threatened, uh, they feel shamed, whatever the word is. And so we're trying to kind of get beyond that. And maybe it sounds like a modest goal, but if we can just have each group add one constituency, whether it's uh, people, individuals with disabilities, uh, uh, immigrants, uh, uh, seniors, uh, school age children, whatever it is that we can help people to to widen that uh, organization um, and and experiment what works. And then, as I said, what we hope to do is if some of these ideas lead to projects, then they'll be useful for other groups to try to experiment with. So, uh, right. Yes, and um, I think you're right, Tim, that it goes to also the point of with the community engagement assistant, what they'll be doing is um, they are creating an annotated resource list for our partner organizations. So they are going out virtually <laughs> um, and they are going to start researching based on the conversations that they have with the, the partner organizations about similar projects in terms of similar size of organization, similar scope of organization, things like that, but to give them something tangible for the partner organization to review and to see, um, to call upon as examples throughout the, um, throughout the project to better understand how other people are working in this area. And one thing this program is not, it's not a, a not that this is a bad thing, but we've all experienced um, uh, diversity training and sensitivity and that's all good, but this is not that. There's not a curriculum that th this is a conversation. And hopefully the conversation leads to uh, resources that people need. If we find that people have a common issue, we can bring in a consultant next year maybe to, uh, to address that, what that means. Uh, what does diversity in Ocean County mean and how, um, <clears throat> how, how can we approach that? So, uh, Tim, just to, just to clarify, are there tools available? I know we talked about the organizations that you're working with hands-on. Uh, some of these groups might uh, not be in that, um, you know, in that circle. Sure. But will the county be able to provide uh, some other assistance uh, other than directly <laughs> with the program to um, either for, for best Absol practices Absolutely. Tools? That's, right. yeah, that's what we're trying to do is, so both this ASLH it's if you are not, if your organization isn't already signed up for that, uh, we can see about getting you signed up. Uh, it's only $55 if you, um, if that doesn't work. Um, and then we're trying to find other resources. Uh, Kristen has been uh, working in this uh, COVID land of uh, just trying to find there are a lot of great seminars out there that are useful. Some are not useful. Some are just so judgmental that, um, you know, outside of making you feel bad, they don't really provide what do I do? What can I do? And uh, so, um, uh, so and, and yeah, so we're going to be making the resources, the webinars, uh, we're going to make them available. And, uh, and then, as I say, we'll follow up in the spring with what uh, anything that people identify as a common issue that they'd like to. So, of course, we've been doing this for a long time. We do programming with the schools to engage different cultures. Uh, we've brought in experts before. Um, but again, we this is the, the novelty of this, I think, and where Kristen has really 
helped us is this this is aimed at a conversation this is not a um, um, you know workplace seminar that you take a test afterwards and forget it that that's not the goal here the goal is to uh, see what people's concerns are and how we can specifically help them I think you're right that the conversation component it's it's so crucial because um, it's those conversations that one has with another that leaves a more lasting impact, I think, some in some ways. Um, so this isn't meant to be tool driven, but just for us to converse about how can we best help you? Um, is it identifying resources? Is it connecting with different communities? For them all, for the partner organizations to think about and to engage in that thoughtful examination of their own organizational culture, their own organizational um, history, and to identify audiences that they haven't yet served. And um, so like Tim said, we are, we are trying to, you know, make it so that we think about if they're able to just meet one additional audience, then we will have done, we will have done good, that we will have um, served a good purpose. And, and, it, and I, I think Kristen's made clear is that we're hoping that we can find examples like uh, Christine has the film festival, right? There may be some other film festivals out there that have had experiences that have worked and maybe sometimes they've tried things that haven't worked. So we're trying to, to make those kind of links sort of out of our general community to help, uh, to help with that, so. Yes. Uh, do you have any, um, Tim or Kristen, either one, uh, do you have any examples yet from within the county uh, of, of areas that have been identified that, that, the, that the assistant and the organization agreed might work? Um, uh, yeah, so I, across the board, we have heard from both the partner organizations and the community engagement assistants about reaching um, younger audiences and that they're not quite sure how to do that. So um, the community engagement assistants feel very confident in the idea of social media. And so they've been working with the organizations to think about their social media plans and their uh, marketing plans and how that uh, best tailor that. Yeah, now you said older or younger. I didn't understand what, what you Oh, I'm sorry, younger, the, a younger, younger audience, yeah. Yeah, well, they hit that, that they, Audio is not always the best on this, and then neither, neither is my hearing. <laughs> sure, no problem. Yeah, yeah. So, so we've discovered some things that don't work, Ron. Maybe that's the, the thing we can start sharing the, the first. So it's a different goal and a different experience of what you say is, I don't want to change the programmings that I'm giving. I just want to get a more diverse audience. Well, that's a goal, right? But that's probably not going to be very successful because um, if you're just saying, I want somebody to come and, and look at my thimble collection because it's really I'm nice. I'm not going to change my diet, Tim, but I want to lose weight. Exactly, <laughs> right, right, exactly, right, right, right. And so, uh, um, you know, we, we do have some contacts and various uh, uh, communities, but again, it's not diversity always, we, you know, we generally think of it as uh, immigrant groups and, and in Ocean County, we have the Orthodox community, uh, but sometimes it's just, um, uh, it's just a different generation, you know, the Z's and the millennials are, are two different groups of people who have very different interests and uh, they, what apply, what attracts one may not attract mm -hmm. another. Uh, I saw, heard some politicians went on and were participating in uh, games, uh, you know, um, video games. I guess you still call them video games. And uh, I thought that was a pretty unique way of outreaching to people. Um, probably not what I'm going to do, but it, it's an interesting idea. So, well, I have noticed um, <clears throat> from several organizations now, and I think that um, Pooch Buckholz and um, and uh, Ray Ray from down the or publishing have been actually going out and starting to do some of their presentations online by Zoom now. I didn't know, any other, I didn't know how many other organizations in the county had, uh, had been trying that or if anybody had been able to do it 
like with you know a two dollar or three dollar nominal fee or something like that, or whether they were just all uh, putting it out there publicly for free. Right. Yeah, I think Ron, that's a really interesting point because what we're finding is that we have had some organiz partner organizations pivot and go to virtual programming. And so I think that's in part why they're more willing to talk about, um, given COVID-19 restrictions, they're now more willing in, in, in some ways to talk about social media. And so the, um, that's why the community engagement assistants are seeing that they're capitalizing on that time because we have all had to go and start doing Zoom meetings, right? That that's how we're all meeting. So um, you, this, the idea of virtual programming will outlive the COVID-19 pandemic. And for our partner organization, for a, a number of them, they were not doing any type of virtual programming prior to the pandemic. So, um, that, yeah. so but, and they, they've entered that arena and they're doing it and they're doing it very well. So they, um, that they feel, they feel a greater sense of confidence now because they realize that they have done that pivot. They are attracting an audience. And so for them to start thinking about social media prior to, they, they didn't, I think they felt that they couldn't do that, but um, it's not that they couldn't, they just didn't yet have the tools to do that, but they, they are figuring out the tools and they're doing it very well. Over the last um, five or six years now, uh, we have um, put most of our prior standard talks on PowerPoint. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I'll give you, um, a little anecdote from our own organization here. When I started meeting this spring uh, via Zoom, it went, oh, oh, Zoom, no, we don't want to use Zoom. Can't we meet in person? And, and you know, we we uh, pulled the board and only 25% were willing to meet in person for some strange reason, just because most of them are older than I am. Um, and then, um, the last meeting I got, I put out a memo. Does anybody want to meet in person? You know, we could spread out the auditorium. Da, 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 da. Oh no, no, we want to meet by Zoom. It's so much more convenient. Yeah. And and uh, Tim knows our board. You know the average age of right. our board. And so um, at this point, I have only one board member that um, uh, won't meet by Zoom because she and her husband don't have a computer. <laughs> <laughs> Right? They don't use computers. And um, and I know perfectly well, I mean, her health hasn't been good. But I know perfectly well that I could get her involved. All I'd have to do is take my laptop computer over to her house. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting, though, Ron, you say that because last night we learned that the Ocean County Library is actually in the process uh, because there is a significant part of the population that's being excluded because mm -hmm. they don't have it on hooked up to yeah. technology and they're actually going they're working on methods to get uh, laptops and hot spots out uh to people where they would be able to take the computer from the library have it in their house and, and be available for these things so now, uh, the problem of course in, in the case of many older people depending on how old they are and whether they were used to electronics or not one of them having the faintest idea how to run it. Well, it's funny, my, my wife was reluctant uh, for her church, um, but now that she has been attending church on the computer, I don't think she's going back. She just really enjoys it. It's like uh, uh, you can you yeah. can have your slippers on, you know. <laughs> I've, seen the same, I've seen the same thing with my wife, who uh, uh, now realizes that if she wants to... Uh, go for her mother's yard site or say or, or say cottage or something like that she doesn't have to go down to the shul if, if the if the uh, weather is bad she can because they, they've got it all online now they did all the high holidays online so she was spending all of her time sitting in front of the computer instead of over it and, and some groups like christine's group uh with the film what they did going to the to the drive-in movie yeah. um I mean, they were already the coolest group in the county, right? But now they're the coolest group and the retro group all at the same time. So, uh, uh, but that was that was a great effort. You're you're muted, uh, Christina. Okay. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to talk about when we were talking about diversity, and and I feel very fortunate that we team with people like the foundation and Beach Haven, 
because I don't know if you looked at our programming this year, but our programming was extremely diverse, including the premiere screening of We as Americans, which was Lauren Hill, the rap singer, that's her. Mm -hmm. And they, we brought a ton of people from that area because you know only people who could drive could really come. But uh, one, and also we did the Eric Garner story, which was a premiere. And what we found was that we got a lot of support to do that, but we also got some negativity. Sure. The community and um, well, the police parked outside stack. That was an interesting experience because they had concerns. Um, so as much as you we you can push diversity and you know certainly film is a really great way to do that you know it also comes with risks and sure. um because our programming this year was pretty um in your face i guess because you know it just was the time it was and we yeah. program in january so we didn't even know any of this was going to go on but um it brings a lot of challenges and the other thing that i want to say is that you know, for um, reaching out to the community, you also have to look at, like in my feeling is like, you know, who are the constituents that can benefit? Like we moved to, not this year, but the year before, you know, we provided buses and we provided buses right. for free all night long and all day long and all weekend long. We had over 2000 people that rode that bus during the film festival. Wow. And none of them, well, I shouldn't say none of them, Many of them were the older people because we kept saying, how come they're here? It's 10 o'clock at night. They're never here at 10 o'clock at night. Right. Well, they're there at 10 o'clock at night because the bus was picking, was dropping them off and everybody could get where they needed to be. So, you know, how you divert your um, resources also really depends on, you know, like what's your group of people that would like to access and older people, as we now know, because we did the drive-in but we also did a virtual cinema with first run films, hmm. which everyone's doing now. But when we were doing it, nobody was doing it. We were the first film festival. I've consulted on nine film festivals around the country now. I wish I could monetize this, but <laughs> I seem to be hooked up for giving it away for free. Um, and what one of the things that we did is we did the virtual cinema, which we're going to continue through the fall and winter. It won't be quite as involved is the one we did for the film festival. And we had a really good turnout. Great. People from not just uh, the area, but from all over the country and all over the world because our filmmakers come from all over. So they were able to access films and the diversity of films that we offer. But I will say it's a rocky road. Right. And the conversations that we had and some of the feedback that we got or didn't get, or the coverage that we got or didn't get, we wondered whether that was a reflection on the diversity of the programming that we did. Sure. And so, so just so what you said before is very important. This is an effort not to be forcing diversity on anybody, but to be encouraging. Uh, think back uh, to 20 years ago when we first started doing. Uh, the ADA uh, in implementing, right? At first people were, I didn't want to do it. And they were, uh, you know, disabled people. Now we know that individuals with disability is a more meaningful uh, common ground. Uh, I think people started to understand that uh, appealing to individuals with their uh, disabilities is not only the right thing to do, it not only meets the letter of the law, but it expands your audience and you can actually make money by doing that. And I think that, so they're the kind of conversations um, uh, that we need to have. And again, of course, I applaud what you've been doing. Um, but, you know, maybe there's a thing that you can't do anymore. I understand that. Maybe for next year, we could even have some discussion groups to focus around the movies you show. That's what Kristen was saying about this conference. It's it, If somebody's giving a presentation, that's a, a beginning. That's a, that's a conversation starter. And, uh, you know, what, what does it mean um, uh, to, to, to be open to different groups? And, and those groups may not be, it, your example of the bus is a great one because those different groups may not be people from a different country. They may not be different. Uh, in a lot of ways, it may just be economics, maybe their difference. Or as you get older, I'm getting older, uh, driving at night is uh, not a pleasant experience. And as Ron said, I'm finding more and more people saying, hey, this thing where I can sit in my house is, is a pretty good deal. And uh, no doubt about that, Pam, because uh, 
I, I, a lot of these people are older than me, and before I got my cataracts done, I wasn't going out at night and uh, not driving at night, not committing right. to do anything at night. And even after the cataracts, I still confine myself to a maximum of an hour's driving at night on roads that I know. I'm not, right. I'm sure plenty of older people are in exactly the same boat. Right. No, I, I think it's, uh, and, and there are lessons that the other people can learn. What Steve Steiner was able to do at Surflight with the, the tent uh, is, is, is remarkable. It's on a, you know, statewide, as with what Christine said, there are people referring to what Surflight did on a state, regional, national level because it was yeah. so, uh, um, not just innovative, because innovative is a, a thing, right? But, uh, you know, what is the, theater and you know mickey rooney and uh, judy garland used to teach us and the movies that predate my birth but they were about let's put the show on right and uh, uh and that and that's a good thing so uh, you know, there's getting to be less and less movies that predate our birth anybody <laughs> <laughs> ron you're you're a little on the pessimistic side tonight i don't know that i'm used to you being a little more optimistic so uh, <laughs> Part of the issue is to put on, you know, one of the things like we do at the film festival is like we showed the film, it was called Skin and it's about the white supremacists. And we had pretty in-depth, every after fi most films, there's a Q and A, except for this year, we did it virtually online. Sure. And some of the conversations are pretty intense. And, and some of the people right. that join in, you know, they watch the film, not because they agree with you. Right. <laughs> they watch the film because they don't agree with you. Right. And um, so those are really valid um, encounters that we have to do. But to do those kinds of things, you also have to have an organization that um, like can be resilient and can dig deep because otherwise, right. especially in these challenging times, that kind of programming can sink you. Right. That kind of programming can sink you. Well, I'm, I'm interested, Kim, and any advice you have too, Christine, you know that, you know me. Yep. I'm interested because um, I think that um, LBI Museum is in, in a position to move uh, online maybe quicker than some of the other small organizations. We have um, a dozen uh, PowerPoints, and they'd have to be spruced up for online work, but I mean, they're basically there. Uh, we've got, we went with the uh, uh, Google 360 video for the map. Uh, we have a preliminary introductory video already made uh, about a minute and a half that talks about the museum. And before, um, before COVID hit, uh, we, we put $5,000 into preliminary work for video, which is in four parts, ultimately, we'll show all of our exhibits. Right. Um, you guys are always up there. I'm interested now in um, monetizing that, as you said, Christine, if I could, and I don't literally mean for money. I mean, you can monetize it for money or you can monetize it to increase uh, people that attend and participate. Now, uh, particularly because of this, uh, uh, Christine, you talked about the buses bringing older people when you were trying to appeal to an older audience because your audience was young. Well, our talks attract old people. We have trouble getting young people into them. So would online talks, talks available online, virtual talks on the history of Long Beach Island, would that get younger people in? Question mark. So, so what, um, just to use an example, what Brooke did down at the Tucker and the Seaport, she hired an 18 year old kid to do the program, if you remember, uh, after Sandy. And so he looked at the world in a different way. So the videos he made are not baby boomer videos. They're, they're videos that appeal to younger audience. And uh, he tried to find things. One of the things we're trying to do, uh, we've had a little time this year is we're we have a lot of resources between the various museums, and we're putting a lot of those online now, uh, things that have to do with um, uh, decoys, hunting. We have a, a video from when Doc Kramer was doing, the, the baseball player was doing um, 
hunting on Barnegat Bay. And I'm hoping that eventually like Connie and uh, Navy Lakehurst have some really great videos, but you have to go to Navy Lakehurst to get those. So what we're trying to do is create a, uh, a, a virtual library where people can go and find these videos. Uh, I contacted uh, 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 Kurt Travers over at the Sandpaper. They had done a number of videos back mm -hmm. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, yeah. uh, when John Lloyd was still alive. And I said, Kurt, are they available? And so it started a conversation. He and Ray Fisk are actually trying to find a way because there's a number of people who are going to buy those VHSs. I don't know if they're available on DVDs yet, uh, is a really limited audience. And so uh, we got to start a conversation with Kurt about, hey, they were really pretty interesting, but who's looking at them? Because now uh, most people don't even know that they existed. And, we, we, uh, used to, we used to sell them in the museum in the old right. Way. And now instead of selling them, we have them set up on a, on sure. a, a video uh, a system. And they're uh, uh, tra been transferred. Uh, talk to Debbie Whitcraft, by the way. She transferred a lot of those onto CD. Oh, okay. okay. Talk, give her a call because we, we get copies from her and, and we run them in the museum. Somebody sure. asks a question about uh, Lucy or whatever, we plug them in and run them. Well, and, and NJN uh, in its history probably did about a minimum of 10 documentaries that had to do with the South, Southern Ocean County region. Um, and uh, we were, so they, they have a total of 80,000 of these movies uh, sitting in a building in uh, Trenton. Uh, and it took us the better part of two months to get copies and permission to show some during the virtual decoy show. Uh, but now there's a, through WGBH in Boston, they're actually going to um, uh, try to make them more available because I would, I dare say that 95% of the people in Ocean County have never seen these, these you know, professionally done um, programs uh, that, that are on our area, so. And I think also to the point uh, that you make, Ron, um, what I've seen on the national research is if organizations are able to do virtual programming for children in some capacity for either the teachers or as an education resource for parents, that it is building such a lasting relationship because um, the both the teachers, I mean, we're now in our second somewhat year of doing virtual learning, but the parents, they, they are craving educational resources for their children um, and that they're not able to go to museums in the way in which they once have. So that, um, and you mentioned before that you're not able to do the children's programming because it does, it presents a whole different um, set of unique challenges. But if you're able to pivot and do that online, that the sites are real, museums are starting to recognize that there's a way in which for them to connect with the education world in ways in which they haven't previously. So it's also thinking about an, uh, a diverse audience in terms of diversity within the school and age in terms of race, gender, um, but that's an audience that we know we really haven't been serving very well is the education world. Um, but you're seeing that the education world is in need of assistance, and we are also in need of assistance because we're not able to bring as many people into our sites as we want so, to. So Kristen had an experience with, with her son, Lincoln, that I, I think this is true, Kristen, where they actually mailed you the components, and then you, through a, a, a Zoom, you actually assembled the items, your craft items, in your home. So there was a tactile connection mm -hmm. by mailing early and I, I yeah i'm so glad you brought that up Tim, because it was um the children's museum of pittsburgh so we're based here in ocean county so we typically wouldn't have gone to the children's museum of pittsburgh but we've now created um a relationship with them in some ways we did this camp several times throughout the summer and they said the same thing that they're getting people from around the country that they're seeing a greater um, greater geographical diversity for their programming than they, than they had previously. Just like um, Christine was saying about she's getting people from around the country and around the world to view her programming. Now in a virtual, in a virtual world, we are able to connect, connect with international audiences. Right. I yeah, think the other thing are, are you getting any money out of it? Yeah, well, actually we, we haven't made any money yet 
Um, that seems, you know, we try not to take nonprofit literally, but it's <laughs> not. Um, but well, we do take it literally, but we still need at least a minimal amount of money. <laughs> you know, I want to at least pay for the, the programming. Yeah. But, um, right now, the field of programming online, because we do a lot of virtual cinema following, is becoming saturated. Yeah. So unless you can do something like I love the idea and I did something similar that I homeschooled my grandson for a week. <laughs> um, and we did something similar with that and that kind of really worked out. I'm gonna have to jump, I have a doctor's appointment. So I will catch you all later, keep me in the loop. Always good to see you, Christine. Well, thank you, Christine. I guess, uh, Kate, I don't know if you're still here but I guess we're, it's uh, an hour. Are we supposed to be wrapping up now or? Um, I mean, it seems like, you know, if anybody has any other questions, um, they could definitely jump in. Um, but if you are wrapping up, we can wrap up. But if, and so if you are part of the program, that's great. If you're not part of the program and you still want to contact Christine, and um, um, uh, I think that she communicates more effectively than I do. <laughs> and so uh, uh, sometimes she might be a better person to speak to, but we're, this is a group effort. And uh Again, this is not the end, it's only the beginning, so. All right. And um, we're looking to ex possibly expand in the spring. So, you know, if we, right. we've been um, talking with our partner organizations that we wanna hear feedback from them that this is, there is a greater sense of commitment when we are all able to share our, our ideas together with one another. So please feel free to reach out with um, any thoughts about the project if you want to learn more, if you're interested in perhaps participating with us in the spring. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. And uh, this is Kate. So I will be, um, I have some emails going back and forth with Kristen as soon as I have the uh, information from her and the video, I'll send it out to everybody who attended today. Thank Great. you again. Um, Tim and Kristen and everybody who joined us. And just a reminder, we do have that Building Families um, uh, Resiliency Working and Learning Together for Home Work Balance uh, seminar that's free happening tomorrow morning. So if you're interested or you know anybody that is, you can certainly email Kate and she will get you, um, get you in. So have a great night, enjoy the evening and we will uh, talk to you soon. Okay.